Hello and welcome back to the Black Hat Chat with both of us this time. Uh, the Black Hat Chat is a collaboration between myself and Reverend Kai. And it's basically just two weird witches getting together and talking about magic and witchcraft and all things nice. And uh, so we're streaming on YouTube and on Twitch. Uh, there's a load of, if you, if you look in the description, there's a load of links in there. Uh, you'll find uh, a link to our Wildwood Temple Facebook group, which is a community that we started uh, safe, safe space for people to come along and just talk about whatever they want to regarding magic and witchcraft. And also in the links down below are one for Patreon and one for Buy Me A Coffee. So if you like us a lot, and I hope you do, then you can buy, well, buy me a coffee. You can buy Kaya a cup of tea. <laughs> and uh, so the links are there. It's patreon.com forward slash black hat chat or buymeacoffee.com forward slash black hat chat. And I think I've covered everything there. So today we are going to be talking about shape shifting, which is an extremely broad topic and covers many, many things. Um, so we should be able to get going for the next two hours. <laughs> <laughs> two hours. Oh, my. Yes. Oh, my. Yes. Um, but it is right, a so, huge broad topic. No, it is. It is. I mean, when you consider shape-shifting, you've got the aspects of people, well, therianthropy, which I can say, <laughs> um, which is... Very much the, the the shifting into actual animal form from human form, and which we find in history quite a bit. And uh, but I, I was actually reading something about the Shua uh, tribe in the Amazon. I think I, I said that right. They have two basic forms of shape shifting. One is that when the person, when a when a tribe member dies, they actually shape shift. They don't die. They never die. They actually shape shift into a tree or an animal. Um, that's where their spirit actually moves on to. Um, and the other one was they use ayahuasca, um, which is quite an interesting topic, especially if we get into Castaneda stuff, uh, where where he shape shifts into a crow or Castaneda, and uh, he he starts questioning Don Juan afterwards saying, did I actually shapeshift? If somebody from general public were to see me, did I, would, would they actually see a crow? And he says, and Don Juan says, it doesn't actually matter. You shapeshifted into a crow. If they can't see it, then they're not ready to see it. <laughs> so. That's something that comes up a lot. Did I actually do it? Was it real? And the implication of that is like, only a physical transformation counts somehow. Mm. You know, and I mean, if you think about the science of what it would take for a physical transformation to happen, I mean, we've got an example of an animal that does it in the butterfly, right? They change mm. from a caterpillar into a butterfly. But in order to do that, they wrap themselves up in a hard cocoon and dissolve into a complete bi a pile of goo and mm. then restructure their cellular structure to become a butterfly. So if humans were to do that, that'd be like a year long process of, you know, changing the underlying structure. I mean, you know, wolves, we both have bones, we both have muscles, we're both mammals, we got a lot of the same parts, but they're definitely not in the same configuration. Mm. And it's interesting to look at the literature over time to see how different, you know, storytellers approach that idea. Some of them, they make the, the recently transformed werewolves ravenous because it would take a massive amount of energy to change your body into something else. I mean, just your cells burning energy would just be huge caloric cost, mm. you know. And usually, movies and TV and, and storytelling, that happens like in a night, at the longest. 
every once in a while I've come upon a story where like it takes a couple of days for the person to transform. But the transformation back is almost always, I fell asleep and then I woke up and I was human and covered in, you know, bits from the forest or blood around the mouth or, or whatever it is that tells of, oh, I was out being a wolf, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to let go of the idea that real is only physical. Well, I think it comes back to the whole, you know, referring back to Castaneda again with the consensual reality. Um, and this physical aspect that we actually see is how the brain's interpreting stuff. Um, so if somebody were to energetically transform from a human into a different animal, that's changing energy, which is different to changing physical form, then... Oh, where was I going with this now? Then the person, a person who cannot, who doesn't have the sight, basically, would not be able to see that energetic form that they're transformed into. They would only see the physical form because that's how the brain's interpreting it. Same with the with the uh, Native Americans who didn't see Columbus's ship. They couldn't see it. They saw the water movement, but they couldn't see the ship because it wasn't part of their reality. They'd never right. heard of a ship before, so they couldn't right. see it. Um, and, and how many people in our modern world can't see because they have been told that they can't see? Yeah. So, so many times, so many times, you know, um, we talked about, I don't remember if this was on a public stream or in one of our private forums uh, at the Wildwood Temple, but we talked about, you know, little kids can see things. They can see all sorts of things, you know, they can see the truth of people. Mm -hmm. And they get told by adults again and again, either that's not real, or you shouldn't say those things out loud, or, you know, all sorts of ways to discount this. And then we grow up and have to rediscover being able to see those things. But isn't that more real than real? <laughs> More real than more real than physical, which is, you know, that same question. Did I really transform? Well, if they couldn't see you, then does it matter? Mm. You know, if somebody who who can't see to the heart of things, who can't see your true self anyways. I mean, does it matter what they saw? But somebody that mm. could see that could truly see, you know, your essence or your hammer or your hoog, they would see you transform anyway, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. John said hello. Hi, glad you found my channel. Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to mention that if we look into something like mediumship, there's a, I mean, even even uh, invocation rituals where you're actually taking the spirit into the body. There's a lot of mention of um, actual physical change, not just the voice, but the appearance of the person actually changes. When it doesn't change to the point, I mean, if you are invoking Hecate's dogs, for instance, you're not going to change into a dog. But there is that, there's almost a physical transformation that does happen which makes you dog-like if i can put it that way yeah the posture changes the manners change there's a mm. you can tell there's a different spirit inhabiting the body mm. you know yeah because people have said i mean especially mediumship you know they, they've said that they they've actually seen the person's appearance the face actually change mm -hmm. physically change but at the same time, is that not a projection, an energetic projection? Um, I don't know if I can say the etheric body maybe masks the actual face and it, it, it appears as if their face has changed. Yeah, I mean, we could read that as, you know, 
the internal spirit now has control of the physical form and so is manipulating the physical form in a different manner, making different muscles contract, that sort of thing, or mm -hmm. that we're perceiving the um, etheric body, the hammer, um, the, the astral body, a lot of terms for, for that thing, and that's what comes through and kind of alters our perception of the physical form. Because, again, back to that idea that the physical is the real thing, and our materialistic focused overculture is very much into the physical is the real, the only real, because it's some kind of consensual reality, because it's uh, provable. There's a lot of a lot of different ways we articulate that support for physicality equals reality. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Tashi just, oh, yeah. Um, I did some work with Tashi a couple of months ago. Tashi, can you just uh, go onto my site, lewjohnson.com, and just email me from there, and uh, we'll discuss what's happening. Um, yeah. But shape-shifting is really a, um, a point where we hit that is physicality the marker of reality? Because I think, you know, looking at historical literature and all of the tales and firsthand experience of many people, they experience some sort of shape shifting. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I went into a hare, I went into a crow, I went into a dog, so on and so forth. And just from the the sheer science side of, of the physical reality of, of cell transformation and cell regeneration, we can guess it's probably not happening, you know, mm. as in a physical body transforms into another physical body. It would not be practical. But the big thing, especially that we find in like old witch literature, is harm happens to the physical body so you go mm. out night riding as a hare and we we talked about this when we did our episode on familiars and the hare gets you know a cut on its leg and when you come back there is a cut on your leg that matches you know so that physical proof is often pointed to as something that makes it quote unquote real because mm. there was some physical something that happened. So even with the idea that we're letting go of, of physical transformation as markers of, of realness, there's still that component, you know? It's actually quite interesting. So if you think about it, if you did some form of shape, shift, let's say, as you said, shape shifting into a hair, and you ran, ran through the woods, you came back the next morning, you found the same cut that the hair got while running through the woods. Now, if somebody was actually sitting there watching you while that was happening, they probably wouldn't see a shift. But if somebody was in the forest who didn't know you were doing this, they would probably see a hair running by. Right. Because your energy has changed, has shape-shifted, your physical body may or not have. But it's it's about how the person actually perceives, as we said, reality. Um, the physical is not ex actually the reality, it's how the, interpret how the brain is interpret interpreting, um, you know, what we're experiencing and what we're seeing and what are raising, what, what, how we've been raised to actually think and believe has actually created this reality. But somebody in the forest who doesn't know that you did any kind of shape shifting would probably see a hair running by. Right. And not necessarily perceive it as a wear hair, a, a human that mm. has been transformed into a hair. Yeah. And so, you know, and this overlaps with borrowing, you know, going sure. borrowing and, and riding around in tandem with the spirit of an animal. But shape-shifting usually is talking about doing that without 
an animal helper of some sort. Although there's plenty of overlap. Um, but a lot of the shape shifting is uh, transforming the self into an animal. And one thing I think it's really neat is when we look back at all of the um, history and lore and stuff that we can find about shape shifting, it's always a local animal. There's mm. no polar bear walking around Equatorial Guinea because some m magician shape shifted. No, it's something, something local, something that blends into the environment. It's uh, an animal form that it is readily acceptable there and some will point to that as proof that well it's not really happening you just saw a hair hairs are around but i think it has to do with um the way that humans have learned to shape shift and how it benefited us as we evolved and especially for the hundreds of thousands of years we spent as hunter gatherers we used our mirror neurons to connect with animals. I mean, we all know today that we have great empathy and connection with animals, those that we've domesticated and take as pets, but other animals also. You know, some people connect with horses, some people connect with dogs, some with cats, you know, some with little bunnies, so on and so forth. And part of that is because we've got this whole um sys system in our limbic system of mirror neurons so mm -hmm. when we watch a dog walk if we focus on that our brains will fire off as if we are walking like a dog mm -hmm. and it's not any different in our brains it's not oh we're watching it no we're doing it yeah that's what those mirror neurons are for and to think about how that impacted early hunter-gatherer tribes. If they watched and focused on their prey, the you know, what they were hunting, to learn to move like them, to learn to walk like them, to learn to think like them, to be able to tell where the herd is going, how much can, uh, you know, the tribe harvest from the herd and it be sustainable because if you kill off your food supply you're not going to make it through next year you want to go you know at a reasonable pace so it makes sense that that was the the logical part where humanity learned to shapeshift and had an extremely practical use for it good hunters mm -hmm. can become one with their prey I mean, we hear that today, you know, when you go deer hunting, you don't just go into the woods and fire wildly and hope you hit a deer because there are a lot of deer around. You wait and you watch and you wait 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 and you wait. And, you wait, and, you wait, and, you wait, right? <laughs> and that sitting silently in the woods and waiting, that active reception, that is a cornerstone of magic all throughout the world in a cornerstone mm. of trance. So I think that shape-shifting is a natural human phenomenon because of that. It's something that is in our, our DNA, it's in our genetic memory, it's in our um, evolution. Well, we, we kind of do it every day anyway. Um... If we consider shape shifting to be the mask that we wear, so you might go to work and you are one person, you come home uh, to your children and your spouse, and you're a different person. It's shifting from one persona to another. Um, Andrea, hello there. I hope I'm not too late. No, you're okay. We'll forgive you this time. <laughs> Um, there is there is something in in the old well. I'm I'm going to refer mostly to the old grimoires now. Um, the there's a there's probably more than one, but uh, there's a Goshic demon. Uh, I can't remember his his name now. Uh, but his ability is to uh, change 
the magician's victim into an animal and that person is not aware that they become an animal and i think there's probably some misinterpretation that's happened there as well and i, I think this, this happens in a lot of the old texts turning somebody into an animal doesn't necessarily mean a dog a cat a jaguar or whatever it could mean just a narcissist somebody who is not a nice person and who runs around screaming and shouting at people, they would be considered an animal. Now, I do think there's just a misinterpretation that's happened. Yeah, uh, that makes me think of, you know, uh, the old Greek stories about uh, the travelers being turned into pigs and uh, like and spirited away when the parents eat the spirits food and they get turned into pigs because they were greedy you know mm. they didn't respect the boundaries and the rules of the spirit world so their their greed and their um, gluttony turned them into a gluttonous animal and mm. i guess we could call that shape-shifting too that's not um conscious on purpose shape-shifting that's like somebody else doing it to you kind of overlaid over the top of but it mm. could also be um the recognition of the of the huger the the internal essence of what a person truly is um being allowed to come out and be expressed and then it is interpreted in a certain way repeatedly because of associations with different collective animal spirits such as being gluttonous being associated with being pig-like mm. you know or being um furtive and hypersexual being associated with being rabbit-like you know mm. um so that may be another way and again that ties into like the lore of familiars and animal spirits around magic workers uh, instead of assisting them, but being energy um, patterns that can be either revealed or imposed upon others. Hmm. Uh, Miss B said, hi, hello, Miss B. And Andrea said, that's insulting to animals in that respect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, yes. and then we have, general associations. we have to consider as we look back, especially, you know, um, think sources like medieval grimoires and ancient tales and old mythology and storytelling, you know, there is um, the literalizing of myth that has really become a, a big deal here in the second dark ages. Were our ancestors really telling literal stories did they really mean these dudes showed up and she turned them into pigs or did it mean these dudes showed up and acted like pigs mm. and because the witch had such a force of will to push those boundaries that it became very apparent that their behavior was not human-like but more pig-like and so makes for a better story and everybody mm. knows it's a story. Everybody knows we're using poetic language, you know, but modern literalizing takes that away, takes that understanding of those layers of poetic interpretation out from under that myth and just tells the, the fairy tale, the child's story over the top of it instead of all the many layers that are below. Yeah, because I mean, we've got the story of... Um... Oh, I've forgotten names now. Keridon. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Guion. Mm -hmm. um, shifting into various animals as she chases him uh, and then eventually eats him and then gives birth to him. Yeah, because he becomes a seed and she turns into a chicken. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah he is reborn through that process. But you know, the poetic understanding of that story uh, of Guillaume Bach becoming Tellies, and there is a rhyme and a reason to those changes to those different animal forms and elements 
who go through um, different transformations so that there it describes the learning and initiation process through this analogy of shape-shifting and mm. it's not some great skill he developed i mean he he got the three drops and boom can shape-shift <laughs> you know suddenly ah, initiation story you know mm. so we can read that as you know that poetic level of understanding the different qualities and the 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 hug that is within these animal collectives and how we can connect our personal hug to the great uh, collective spirit of the different animal kindreds. Mm. Uh, do you want to answer Andrea's question there? I think you actually answered it earlier. What is your opinion about people who have a connection with animals? Well, I mean, we've got the empathetic connection and like the mirror neuron connection where we maintain our distinct humanity, but can feel ourselves connecting and, and empathizing with an individual animal. But there's also uh, other kin. That's the term that's used in, in modern times um, where it turns out that the person's hug is not human after all mm. their internal essence of who they truly are is actually a cat or is actually a dog or you know whatever it is they are much more connected to that um, animal kindred than they are to the human kindred so i mean with with the many fold um possibilities that are inherent in the unfolding of life and the messy genetic bleh, that happens in evolution sure that's going to happen Very sometimes scientific word there. <laughs> it comes with the facial expression too uh, <laughs> so we all we all know from watching life try again and again you know whether it's in plants or in animals or what that sometimes it doesn't get put together right but that doesn't mean it doesn't work. That's what mm. evolution is, trying a bunch of different options until something works and then running with it, you know? And so the idea that you could end up with a, a Hammer that looks human, but a healer that looks cat-like, of course, that's a possibility. Mm. But I think that the topic of the other king is quite interesting. And it does it does fall into the shape shifting aspect, so I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> um, as, I, you, I actually, as you judge my sideways inclusion of the topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually liked Dion Fort as far as I remember it was Dion Fortune's uh interpretation of how this happens. Uh she was speaking specifically of how um, a human becomes fey. Uh and it was basically that at some point during the gestation period before the spirit actually enters the fetus uh there's a a, a spirit that comes along gets tangled up in the all the all the, the mixy mashy stuff and instead of the human soul going in although i think i think she actually said that it's a combination of both at the end of the day but that fey soul actually goes into fetus um, but it can create problems for the person during life because, uh, you know, the fey soul has one, you know, an element that's more pronounced than should be in a human, whereas it's, you know, a balance of, of all four elements. So it does cause problems for them. But I quite like the explanation that the unfortunate gives of that. There's a lot of explanations across different cultures and times about how this happens, why this happens, which just tells me that it happens. It happens frequently to humans, regardless mm -hmm. of culture, regardless of time. And we don't 100% know what's going on. So we're using our best guesses with, within each culture and time to try to explain what's going on, you know the technology and understanding that we have. 
Yeah, but that then support that falls under um, where folk, werewolves, where everything else. Um, you know, where are we? I don't know. Um, well, but now, werewolf hmm. comes from where used to mean man, person, as in hmm. weregild or, or werewolf or, or so on and so forth. So all werewolf is, is the combination of the Anglo-Saxon word for person and the Anglo-Saxon word for wolf. And it just shows the two together. But it usually means a person that's kind of wolfy or a wolfy that's kind of person-y, you know, because mm. I don't know. If you spend a lot of time in the forest or in in non-human places where you're quiet and, and you don't go mucking about and making a bunch of noise, you will encounter animals, right? Because there are lots of animals there. And every okay. once in a while, you'll encounter one that seems a little too human mm. compared to the others. And it makes you go, well, is there a person in there? Is someone borrowing? Did they transform? What is going on? Mm. And it doesn't take a lot to encounter that. Really, it doesn't. You know, a couple of weeks in the forest and you'll run into it. So I'm sure our ancestors were running into that frequently and going, mm. what is happening? And hence yeah. the idea of cut it and see who shows up with cut on their leg the next day in the village kind of thing you know yeah um but i think with, with uh werewolves i mean a lot of people talk about them themselves being werewolves or vampires or etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i think in a lot of cases it's it's that animal nature that a person has uh, I, I usually refer to it as the fetch beast. Um, you know, they when when they are journeying, they they actually often do shift into that animal form, which is their 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 beast, their power animal. I suppose we could call it as well. Um, but if they do have a very wolf-like nature, they will show signs of being wolfy, and. I find that the the moon does play a part, and it's not necessarily the full moon, uh, which you know all the stories tell us about. It can be any phase of the moon, but it's usually that phase of the moon every month. Mm -hmm. um, As an just, astrologer, you know, it's the um, Saizigi, the the phase that happened just before they were born. Uh, we consider that the yeah. phase that that triggered birth, not necessarily. Okay what happens at the moment they're born, but it's the, the potent alignment that triggers birth and causes it to happen. So mm -hmm. one of those four quarter phases, oppositions, conjunctions, or squares. Uh, but it's really neat to see that show up. And, and there's a way to track what fetch or what animal um, tribe the person is connected to based on that says Iggy, that phase that triggers birth. Oh, we're going to have a conversation after this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be pulling up your chart. <laughs> Again, yeah. <laughs> but so the fact that that has entered a, a science um, as remote and refined as, as Western astrology, I find fascinating. That that's still there. Of course, it's in traditional astrology, and this is my personal interpretation as a trad witch who does this sort of shape shifting stuff. But it's there in the lore if you go looking for it, and it lines up again and again and again and again. So I would say whether it's like the idea that a soul floats along and gets tangled up and then gets put in with a human soul because they're all mixed up, or it's just an option, or you know, um, I think of it like humans have aptitudes, they have kinships, they have things they're drawn to and things they're naturally good at and things they're not drawn to or in things they're just not good at. Mm -hmm. And all of that takes developing skill to do it well, but 
They have aptitudes, and some humans have an aptitude for shifting into a wolf or shifting into a horse or whatever it is. And they may see that aptitude early on in life, not necessarily as the ability to shift, but the ability to communicate mm. on some other level. You know, you can look into a dog's eyes and go, oh, their stomach is upset. They really need pumpkin. The dog did not sit up and tell you that, you know, <laughs> but somehow, some way, perhaps through mirror neurons and years of observance, perhaps through other means, it happens. So many humans can tell you stories of these deep connections with animals and these um, moments of empathy and communication that can't be explained any other way. And I think those are the same mechanism by which shape-shifting works. Mm. That connection to either an individual animal spirit, which I would call borrowing, or to a collective animal spirit that I would call shape-shifting. Mm. You know, are you going with a guide, borrowing, or are you joining the tribe on your own, shape-shifting? Yeah, it's very much what uh, Andrea was just asking or commenting on. Um, she said, I get on with animals better than humans, and I see through their eyes. I see the sentience in the animal. Yeah, it's very much the, the borrowing aspect, which I actually, before I heard the term borrowing, um, I was taught in practical Kabbalah about identification, which is very similar. Um, with identification, you transfer your nefesh, your lower soul or lower self into a tree, animal, rock, whatever you're actually identifying with. And you, your nefesh combines with the nefesh of that animal. And then you can, yeah, very, very similar to borrowing, if not the same. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. you know, all of these terms, all of these um, names for things, we're going to have tons and tons of overlap, overlapping things. Because, again, it's a human experience that people are describing and classifying throughout time and throughout different cultures. And so we're going to land on this same human experience again and again. You know, mm. there are slight differences. There are nuances depending upon the culture and, and how they divide the world up and what the worldview is. But when we see it occurring over and over and over, I think that's the mark of, of realness, of reality, mm. not physicality necessarily. Yeah, I think the main thing to actually remember here is that when people talk about shape shifting into an animal, um, they are not necessarily saying that they are physically changing their, you know, their organic body. They, however, are shape shifting energetically, and the only reason somebody may not see that is because they are their reality doesn't allow it. Yeah, they are, I think that's the main thing to, to take into consideration. They are purposely blocking it out, or they don't have an aptitude for that. You know, mm. some people, when we talk about um, clairvoyance, clairsentience, clairaudience, we got all those words because some people hear things, some people see things, some people know things. There's different ways to experience that information coming through and how it filters through your own set of senses. I, I have mm -hmm. hearing loss. I've, I've been going more and more deaf for years and years and years. And the worse my physical hearing gets, the better my other hearing gets. Mm. You know, and, and there's plenty of people like that, where that sort of seesaw happens as the mind can interpret things that it couldn't before and bring them up to consciousness. Mm. But there's also the old shape-shifting practices of needing the hide of an animal or the bones of an animal and actually putting on the skin of an animal to do the shape-shifting mm. you know so this this outlies the physical transformation to help aid the internal transformation and especially when we're talking about hunter-gatherer tribes and having 
you know, the magical technician that needs to be able to track the herd or ask the herd for a sacrifice to be able to feed the tribe, you know, that person who, whose job and function that is within the tribe needs a surefire guaranteed way to repeat this procedure. It can't just be luck. You know, if they need to collect, connect with the reindeer, they need to connect with the reindeer because it means feeding their people. It means survival. So you would use every tool in your toolbox to make sure that that is successful, that you do actually accomplish that shape shifting so that you can accomplish your end goal of making sure that your people survive. And that's very similar to wearing a mask uh, mm -hmm. during ritual, uh, yeah. an animal mask. Uh, then you go into trance and you become the animal, etc., etc. Uh, Andrea, true, the body doesn't change, but the spirit moves into a, a different shape. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. the energy body. Yeah. Uh, I've watched people who hunt move like the animals. Yeah. Um, Kyle was actually talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. And the hunter turn to gather an example as well. Hello, Kerry. Hello. Glad you can make it. All right, should we take a break? Well, if we're going to go two hours, we're only 40 minutes in. Are you ready? Joke about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we've got we've got quite a bit to talk about. Okay. So we can take a, br a brief break here. Um, all you folks watching on YouTube and Twitch, please uh, put your questions and your thoughts and your comments in the chats so that we can answer them, discuss them. I'm sure there are things y'all are thinking of that we aren't thinking of because <laughs> mm. this is a big, broad topic and there's a lot of a lot of different paths to take here. Yeah, and if you think of them, then we can answer them. Well, hopefully. All right. All our brains together yeah. are better. <laughs> Usually, yeah, especially with mine. All right, so we're going to take a five-minute break. Do not go anywhere. We are, or you can go. You can go and make a cup of coffee if you want to, because that's what I'm going to do. Um, if you would like to support us, there are links in the description below. And if you haven't joined the Wildwood Temple, go join it because you don't know what you're missing out on. And yeah, we'll see you in about five minutes or so. Cheerio.
Welcome back to the Black Hat Chat, where we are talking about shapeshifting today. Finally. Yes, finally. <laughs> we do apologize for the uh, interruptions. Uh, stuff just came up, and it was unavoidable. Right, so shapeshifting. Where are we? Let's just check comments here. Everybody's saying hello, and Andrea is letting Jasper out for a pee. Good to know. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> important very important yes it is it's very important uh don't take notes for the first part of the chat i'm going to scroll through to see what i missed okay so no questions nobody's got any questions so um thinking of the you know putting on the skin it reminds me of selkies selkies have to have their skin in order to transform and there's lots of lore about trapping a selkie by taking their seal skin so that they can't transform back and they have to stay as a human. Okay. So the idea that there is this um, necessary physical component in order to do what is natural to the individual. But there's still... They're still very much connected to a tribe. They're still very much connected to um, the the bigger community of Selkies. And then, obviously, the community of humans. Because there has to be a human trapping them, you know, for this story to occur. So, you know, usually when the Selkie is trapped, then they feel the longing. They feel the call of the sea or... There are selkie kin that come and visit them and try to help them get back or help them find the skin so that they can transform back. And it's always seen as like going back home, going mm. back to what they truly are. And I think that ties right back into my theory, at least, of other kin. They're not mm. truly just human under there. Their 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 hug is human plus or something else. Sometimes not even human. There are plenty of people that describe feeling like they can't be part of the human tribe for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, coming back to other kin, that happens quite a lot. Um. I think a lot of witches feel like that as well. They just don't belong, which is why they become very solitary creatures. You call. Yeah. Um, yeah, which comes back to community. Yeah. We need community. We need community, and if we can't Otherwise find it, in, if we can't find it in humans, we'll find it in anything we can. Mm. And if we connect better with, say, the the community of ravens than we do with the community of humans, then you know. That's where we find our connections. But being able mm. to to cross that boundary, to ride that hedge, that is definitely a, a witch aptitude or, mm. or inclination or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. All right. Uh, everybody loves silky stories. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think it's... So... Selkies are up, in, you know, in the the green emerald isles there where those kinds of stories originate. And there's an influence that the werebears and the other were creatures in that area have the same kind of function as selkies in that they need the physical component. They need to put on the skin. Um, but some of them are just, you know, having the claws or the teeth or um, not even a complete hide, just a piece of it to blend the energies back together to be able to transform. I don't know if that happens in other cultures. I mean, I know there's um, some South American, northern part of South American cultures that use uh, wearing the skins in community ritual as a form of, of transformation. 
but I don't know if there's other lore that says like they have to have it and you can take it away and therefore prevent shape shifting. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say, doesn't this fall back into the QR tribe of the Amazon um, as they die, they shape shift into an animal, but not really. Yeah. Uh, well, I suppose they they change their skin. Yeah. In a sense, yeah. Um, and changing the skin is a common kinning for all sorts of shape shifting. You know, mm. um, get comfortable in the skin you're in, or change it. Yeah. <laughs> Again, that comes back to changing your persona at the end of the day. Yeah. Which is also, again, a form of shame shifting. I think many of the masking and the guising rituals that we find in especially European traditional witchcraft are directly born out of community shape shifting rituals, especially uh, the ones where everybody takes up a different animal. Somebody comes mm. and is crow, someone comes and is dog, someone is cat, someone is deer, so on and so forth. And the transformation, the shift happens collectively, even though everybody's shifting into something different. And yeah, just that energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of those guising rituals um, in groups, you're tested to see where your affinity is and then you join that tribe so you know you may have crow spirit so that you join the crow tribe and that's who you always mask as and who you always transform into and some of them work that there are you know the 13 sacred animals and everybody takes a turn on the wheel and goes through all of these shifts through all of these kindreds of animals in order to learn the wisdom and the lessons that each one has to give and share with us. So mm. there, there are different ways to approach that. Um, but in both of those kinds of situations, everyone's in. It is assumed, it is understood that everyone can develop the skill of shapeshifting. It's mm. not a specialized skill only for a few people. Yeah. I suppose we can also talk about glamour. Mm. Um, I actually knew a guy years ago who physically he he was a good looking guy um, he had a great body and everything else uh, but he said that he never ever did any exercises he never went to the gym all he did every morning was get up look in the mirror and tell himself that he, he looked a certain way and over time um, he actually transformed to what he wanted to look 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 like look, look like. Um, so I mean that that would be glamour in a sense, but I mean when people talk about glamour, it's that instant sort of you know change the appearance of the color of my eyes or you know stuff we get from the movies and the craft. Yeah, yeah, the famous uh, eye changing scene has made yeah. an impact. Yeah, I do that. I do that every day. I change the color of change my hair. Change the color of your hair. Today, Ben. <laughs> um, and that is me. that is a form of glamour. I think glamour and shape shifting get down to the heart of things when you change your hammer so that it actually affects the life. You mm -hmm. know, and they can be long term or short term, but you got to work on it for a while before it's easy to make the shift. Mm -hmm. And the Hammer is the astral body, the etheric body, the shape of the self, who we really, not who we really are, that's a huger. Um, but, and the physical form will always mimic the Hammer because it takes all its cues from that, just like things start in the astral and manifest into the physical. They take their cues from that, the shape has to come from somewhere it has to grow from somewhere and so that that root form of the hum and how it shifts and shapes can be very animal-like but it can also just be blue eyes instead of brown 
you know and i think the um human phenomena uh widespread of body modification is very much in response to the hammer expressing itself in the leech you know mm -hmm. manifesting you know uh, we dye our hair we get tattoos we pierce parts of our body we do all sorts of other things too for body modification we wear clothes that reshape our body you know we paint our bodies uh, temporarily to express what's inside outside mm. yeah andrew says my hair is still black without dye and i didn't like my teeth so they're just gone i've got the same problem <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think for the benefit of everybody, shall we shall we just uh, give an, um, a definition of uh, hammer, etc., etc., etc. All these word, words I'm using. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I know in Nordic terms, the the soul has eleven parts. I think it is. Well, so there is a a modern soul complex um, in heathenry or or northern paganism, but it's all. It's all modern constructs. There's no looking back in the sources and anybody went, this is how it works. We're putting together mm -hmm. lots of different terms from lots of different times and lots of different cultures and doing our best guess. Um, but I, I use the words a lot because I think they're useful in describing my understanding of how the soul works. So the leaf is the physical body. It's a physical form. It's this flesh vessel. The hammer or the ham is the shape of the self and that's what shifts when you shape shift. And so it is the the astral seed of the physical manifestation. And then the hug is the essence of what you really are deep down inside. Like it is the true form of the self. And all of those, plus a lot more bits, fall under what we would probably call the soul, including the physical body, because there is no separation of the mental, the spiritual, the physical. They're all all together. And in a lot of, you know, heathen or northern philosophy, the filgia or the fetch or the familiar is also part of that. They're part mm. of the soul, even though they're another being an independent sentient entity that you do not necessarily control. So your soul is bigger than you. You are a body that's inside your soul. Your soul is, is a thing you reside within. And it has some immortal parts and it has some parts that go different places after you die and do different things. It has some bits that dissolve and some bits that hang around and that sort of thing. But the body is not the container in that case. The body is just the, the machinery that operates in the physical so that you can touch things and you can eat things and you can have a physical form. Mm, that, can we say that the hammer is, is sort of like the glue? Mm, no. No. <laughs> That's probably the woad. Um. <laughs> okay, yeah, it was that part. I knew so, it was one of the parts. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be the woad, maybe. The woad is, I mean, woad is woden, Odin. It's the mm. the ecstatic um, poetic madness, the animating force that makes us think and dream and create and gives um, form to to the process of life expressing itself without control or regulation. Mm. Inspiration. Inspiration. Mm. Yeah, mm. which is, I mean, why we inspire and respire, because yeah. life is woad and, and creation. Life itself is that force that moves and, and becomes and unbecomes and makes and unmakes again and again. Mm. Uh, Andrew says, sorry for losing my list of questions, but I held <laughs> on to it for a while. I told you to send it to me so it wouldn't get lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, so 
I'm using the word Hammer, uh, but there is also Haim, Hide, Hid, Hama, Shine, Shine Hue, Shin Hue, and Shimmering. Those are all, <laughs> all referring to the same thing, uh, depending upon culture and time. And there's also um, the idea that the Shining Ones, you heard that term for either uh, the Tuatha de Danan or the Good Folk, or, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of places that the Shining Ones has been applied to. That comes from people. Shine Hue, not because they were beings of pure light, but because their Hammer was stronger than their Tleek. So they had mm -hmm. more of an etheric or astral body than they did a physical body. So we could say the shining ones are the ones that you can see on the astral, but have not necessarily made a manifestation into the leak, into the physical. Mm -hmm. And okay. other terms. Also, another word we get for leak is raw. And that's why we call meat raw. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kerry said this healing stuff is awesome, Rev Kai. I want to use shape shifting with my personal journey of healing and losing weight. Yep, can definitely use it for that. Um, it's as we, as you keep saying, it's not like a instant uh, switch from one to the other. You know, we we live in this instant coffee society and fast food society, and we think everything you know will just do this and it'll just happen. But uh, it can definitely happen. Yeah. Um, it's work and transformation over time. And I would say that the most successful people I know that have applied magic to things like weight loss have worked on their hum. Mm. You know, they have um, changed that so that the physical form follows. I think it also applies to the, well, working with the energy body. Um, I'm going to talk about qigong again um so when we're not doing any kind of work on the energy body so that the energy is not flowing properly and it becomes stagnant and it goes Bleh. another scientific term <laughs> um then all of a sudden we start we think okay i want to look a certain way i want to be a certain way and we're going to transform ourselves then we start working on the energy body and we get we, we mash up that stagnant energy and we get it moving again properly and there's there's a definite physical transformation that happens because now the energy is moving again uh -huh. um which would relate to the hammer not so yes got that right <laughs> it's really one mm. syllable but there's kind of a swallowed r on the end but yeah yeah Okay. Close enough. Well, Close enough. Almost. Close enough. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, but that again is shape shifting. Yeah. It's, it's transforming from one thing into another. Um, but it's, I'm going to say it's not instant, but I've actually noticed myself if I slack off for a couple of weeks and I, I go, Ugh. you know, that scientific term once again. Yeah. And then, then I start doing Qigong and start moving my energy again. There's a definite transformation that happens from one day to the next, almost. Um, you know, I don't look different, but... Well, I, I can tell in how my pants fit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I The first transformation always happens in my gut, and I always consider that that's because it's the cauldron of manifestation. But mm -hmm. it's also where a third of my neurons are, you know, they're in the intestines packed in around the gut. And if I don't do energy work, you know, or I, I get sick and I lay in bed or whatever happens, slack off and bleh, and it all kind of pools down around my waist and in my gut. And then yeah. suddenly my pants don't fit, you know, and stuff like that. But if I pick it up again, that will move and and transform and things will flow freely and especially if i'm making sure to move energy through those areas of the body you know take it up out of that cauldron and up into the other two cauldrons and actually get things flowing turn things over right 
there is a physical portion and it's not completely instant but it is within a day or two especially mm. if you've done energy work for years just slack off for a bit and start back up you know yeah, that was, sort of thing I was going to say, I mean, the next morning I look in the mirror and all of a sudden my stomach's flatter. Uh -huh. But I thought I was being facetious. Uh -uh. <laughs> I mean, I think that's why we called that the the cauldron of manifestation. Mm. That area, the gut, the, you know, the the massive amount of energy and physical transformation that we hold there, because that's also where we turn food into cells. You know, that's mm. where we make that that weird transference and transformation from solid food to potential caloric energy. Mm. That's the place where that all connects. And that's where our belly button is. That's where we were connected and quite probably received the soul. That's where sex and reproduction happens. You know, it's all there. And so... Mm. The energy flowing through there and moving and it's not backing up and blocking up and therefore piling up and yeah flatter mm. stomach <laughs> yeah it makes sense i mean also the 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 abdomen's the area of the of the element of water um so if you are doing some kind of energy work you're actually uh, i'm not going to say kundalini but you are stoking the fire uh -huh. um, and that water starts moving and would evaporate on a bit of a different level. Hello, Lau. Uh, hello, Lau. How are you? Andrea says the gut and the heart have neurons as well. Yes, the three brain centers in our body one's up here, one's around our heart, and one's in our gut. Also, the three cauldrons that we mm. use for, for moving and transforming and all of that energy stuff. Um... Is Hubby going to ask questions then? <laughs> I don't see any questions from Hubby. Great technical terms. Yes, we have fantastic technical terms. Wonderful technical terms. Fantastical technical terms. Yes. We can't come um, up with other bits. <laughs> <laughs> Elastic waistbands in a pinch. Now there's, uh, there's uh, something. Uh, Elastic waistbands are good for. Um, you know, changing size, but if you're constantly putting something tight around your cauldron of manifestation and not allowing the energy to flow, probably ain't going to work too well. So, oh. you know, don't. that's why we wear those big loose flowing robes when we do magic, because it's enough to keep you warm and keep the bugs off your butt, but it's not going to bind up anything on your body. <laughs> Uh, Lau said, I have been having problems just in that area since I started to implement the work every day. I mean, some rituals like LBRP, maybe my energy is accommodating itself. Yeah, if you've, if you've just started doing such rituals, what you'll probably find is that, you know, you've had years and years of stagnant energy. Then you start doing uh, rituals which actually start moving the energy around. It can take a while for that energy to start getting into sync and start moving properly how it should move. Um, but you'll notice over, over time it will get better. And as we just said, you know, if you've been practicing for a while and then all of a sudden you slack off and you go Bleh, again, and then you start, you pick it up. Uh, it's it's kind of an instant, um, you know, just picking up the baton and running with it. Uh, Andrew said he's got too many questions. He says, I'm too skinny at the moment, so I will do a swap. <laughs> you can do a swap with me because I'm not too skinny. <laughs> well, you know, we can go the other way. It might not be that the energy is stagnating and building up. It might be that it's bleeding out, you know, mm -hmm. and draining yeah. out of that area and perhaps the, the soul body needs patched or needs another source of input you know mm. so the physical form i mean what we're what we're saying through all of this is the physical form echoes the energetic form whether that's mm. turning into a bat 
or or getting a couple of inches nipped off the waist you know <laughs> the physical form mimics that energetic form and if you want to change the physical form it's very useful to work on the energetic one first so yeah. um carrie said the center of gravity in the third chakra so I'm going to go off on a slight tangent. I don't think most people in the Western world should be using a seven chakra system because our worldview does not break down the importance of those energy centers within the body the way that the Eastern worldview does, especially when it comes to the third chakra, the spleen. How many sayings have we heard in growing up in our Western culture about the importance of the spleen? Did you give your spleen for something? Did your spleen cause you to do something? Did your spleen give you the idea for something? We don't have any connection to that seat in our body for that idea of energy and its manifestation in our cultural paradigm, nor its uh, movement. Some of the others we connect very well to, such as the throat or the brow, um, sometimes a crown, but that particular area is really uh, one that doesn't translate well because our worldviews differ in that respect. So um, I think the cauldrons are easier to connect to because of the Western worldview that seats ideas in the head, in the heart, and in the gut. And therefore we have cultural force and um, understanding at a macro level about those areas of seats of power, energy, and transformation that we can relate to. So, side side mm -hmm. thing. But yeah, the center of gravity um, for some people is that low down there around the belly button. Um, depends on how you're built. For some people, the center of gravity is clear up here behind the breastbone. And for some, it's even lower down between the hips. So... Mm -hmm your center of gravity it can be your centering spot when it comes to centering your energy and uh, placing a anchor point the the central nail in the star to wrap the auric shield around but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is the same point for everyone nor that it is the same chakra or cauldron for everyone but you can move it too so yeah, I was going to say you can actually move your center of gravity. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, so Alistair said he's got too many. I assume too many questions because that's Andrea's Alistair. Ah, uh, no that's such thing will. as too many I questions. Know, we, we like questions. We love questions. Um, my 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 teacher always said the stupid questions are the ones left unasked. Mm. <laughs> Definitely, no, that's true. Uh, Andrew said it's so strange that I did so much, and I agree with Rev Kai. I am leaking energy to somewhere else. Hmm. We'd have to have a look at your energy body, darling. Yeah. Well. Yeah. While I just play with my beard. <laughs> And uh, Kerry said, with Kai, with my experience as a surgical tech, I know that our organs, I know what our organs look like and tell mine positive affirmations daily. I thank them for their work on keeping me healthy. Very good idea, actually. Yeah. yeah. I, I do meditations that work a lot with my physical body, and um, those are definitely based on, um, you know, anatomy and physiology and understanding where my organs are. But I'm talking about cultural understandings of places of emotions and force and thinking within our body. So those are things that um, come from the culture that we're in. Just like when we were talking about cultural appropriation, you work in the culture that you're in. Context is king. It's where you are. And we are in a river of magic and flow. And, you know, I talk about that with astrology. We're in that river, and you can tell what the currents are by reading the astrology. But part of that river is the cultural paradigm that we're in, is the other people that we are with and the cultural ideas and how they are divided up. 
and we can be in different cultural paradigms, but we must be fully immersed in them. And living in a Western culture means being immersed in that Western cultural paradigm and having to work with the tools available at the time. And our Western cultural paradigm doesn't have a connection to the idea of what a spleen does. Now, if you've been through med school, you know where a spleen is, you know what it does, you know how important it is, you know, in the nephrology and how it's, you know, very, very necessary for balancing all of the chemistry in your bloodstream and that sort of thing. But if I go talk to, you know, Joe McWitch hat down the street and say, how is your spleen feeling? <laughs> I'm going to get that look. That's what I'm talking about, that overculture paradigm. So there's always a macro and a micro in all of this. There's our individual choices and our individual um, ideas and, and decisions, but there's always that macro level that we have to be aware of and work within and use those tools there. And we cannot individually change that macro level no matter how much we want to. Many of us are very unhappy with certain aspects of that macro level. And part of that is why we're witches, to, to change the things, you know. But we have to be aware of what that umbrella is at the moment in order to work with it effectively. And especially learning new concepts, learning to new techniques, you got to start where you are. You got to be aware of the rock you're standing on. You cannot point to that rock over there and go, I want those understandings because you're not there. Mm. Um, Alistair asked or said, I'm, I'm listening, very interested. A bit undereducated though, that's fine. Uh, how long were you both practicing before you saw results? Immediately, I think. When, when we say results, we, we I, I think that's gonna differ from person to person. I mean, when I say immediately, I sat down and did my first circle casting which was basically just projection of energy as a sphere that cuts into the ground and next minute i was floating through space on this little piece of grass um bubble spacecraft i've done yeah, that yeah <laughs> totally done that it was that. a bubble in space <laughs> so results yeah the the sticky word there is results what results are mm. you looking for Physical manifestation, well, that takes a while, mm. you know. Um, emotional impact, that can be pretty quick. Uh, transformative experience, day one. That's that's mm. what we're after, transformative experience. So um, we're using a lot of terms and we're referencing a lot of historical bits and we're talking about a lot of different cultures. And that's not to show off our education. That's because different things click for different people. And mm. we're dancing around the numinous, things we can't necessarily put into words. So we're, we're coming at it sideways with poetry and you know mythology and everything else we can to describe this thing that we can't necessarily put into words, hoping that one of the many breadcrumbs that we drop along the way is a connection point for someone else or opens up a door for someone else. So, you know, out of, out of 10 things, if only one of them makes your brain click on and go, wait, that's it. Cool. That's awesome. You don't have to worry about the other nine. We're just mm. trying to, to get at it as many ways as possible. So... Yeah. But when it does click, then you, you at least understand the other nine. Yeah. Um, and what they were actually referring to. Because again, just... you got to start where you are. And you can only, leaps in knowledge only happen. You can only go one step away from what you already know. Mm. So it's, a, it's an incremental process. And especially in, in situations like this, we don't know where you are. We don't always know where we are. <laughs> which is why we often sit here talking a load of crap well that's why uh, we have well, these conversations well. is to yeah. to suss that out and figure that out and and wrap our minds and our understanding around things in different ways mm. 
I think we've gotten away from the topic of shape shifting itself, didn't we? We have, but eh. oh, so okay. glamours. I tend to think that good glamour is pretty much the same technology as shape shifting mm. because it, it's really working on the the hom the the internal body to change the physical form however if i were doing a glamour to appear invisible i would call that glamour and if i were turning into a crow i would call that shape shifting even though mm -hmm. down at the the technical do the work level i'm really kind of doing the same thing i think so yeah, because you're you know, you're, trying, you're transforming your energy into something different mm -hmm. Invisibility is a very interesting topic, actually. <laughs> <laughs> One of my, my favorite toolboxes for getting through big crowds. Mm. <laughs> um, but again, but I mean, we can bring it into the same the same aspect. You know, people hear the, the term shape shifting, and they immediately think that you physically transform into something else. And invisibility is the same thing. You actually become. Uh, invisible physically invisible but it it's more a case of becoming unnoticed mm -hmm. yeah you know so i think it's mostly i think the big problem is just movies movies and books they're fantastic love them but well, uh you know, a bit of a bad interpretation here and there it, it it's literalizing it instead mm. of reading the many poetic layers you know, mm. storytelling is a complex, magical art that can make a different reality come alive and manifest in a myriad of ways. But when we try to flatten that, when we try to step on the magic and make it into a little tablet that everyone can swallow, we lose a lot, you mm. know? And I mean, Movies are great in that they give um, an interpretation to a lot of forms of magic and ideas. I mean, we can just reference glamours in the craft and hair color changing, and everybody knows what we mean if they've seen that movie, mm. you know. But there's other things that we can reference, like the idea of filgias that come out of, oh, Bill Pullman? Maybe that's not right. Um, yeah, uh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, uh, my I brain know. is grasping for words at the moment. The Book of Dust. Yes. So there's a whole understanding uh, of the field, yeah, the follower, the fetch, the animal spirit manifesting, how it relates to coming of age, how it plays a role in society, how it can help, how it can be harmed, everything else. All in this story that we can just reference this story and go, hey, that's pretty close to how I understand Philgia, you know? So, yeah. but the, the thing is, um, when we flatten it, when we try to take out all those many roots and layers and, and poetic kennings and mythology that are underneath it, that's when things go icky. When you say a glamour is only changing my eye and my hair color like that. Mm. A glamour, you know, is an actual cloak of invisibility and really, poof, I'm gone. You know, that's when we try to take that out of it, then we lose so much. But I think mm. the, the necessary human tribal skill of storytelling and articulating these internal numinous things into a story form is still extremely vital and now it's people who make movies mm. just as much as it's people who write books yeah um carrie said that she needs to look into the book book of dust it's uh philip philip pullman thank you philip um and there was also a movie, The Golden Compass, yes, uh, which is based on the book. And there's now a series, actually, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually pretty good. But, um, and Andrew's been sorry, yeah, Carol. No, go ahead. 
Andrew's been writing quite a bit here. Um, this is quite fascinating. I used to work with energy without realizing it, but I was very effective. Now I am a bit lost. I think, yeah, that often happens when you realize what you're doing and then you start analyzing it a bit too much. And uh, it's, it's the same thing with any practice that you, you, you know, the beginner starts with, you know, they sit down and meditate and it's just this esoteric experience, this amazing thing that happens. And then the next night they sit down to do exactly the same and they expect exactly the same thing to happen and the expectation blocks it. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's probably what's happened. You were doing it naturally and then you realize what you're doing and now all of a sudden you try and force it. Um, or you think about it, analyze it too much. It, it's mm. that grabbing your magic by the tail and dragging it back. It's that lust for result. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she said, I love these conversations and how they touch on, on so many different things. Yeah, we love these conversations as well. Um, I was great at being invisible at school. Yeah. Now there's something. Lots of people have magical experiences and an enhancement of magical skills that happen during school time. That adolescent age where we are in an environment that is outside of our control, around a lot of people that are outside of our control, but also when our bodies are doing the most growing, energy moving, physical transformations that we remember. They're doing a whole lot of it when we're little too, but we don't remember that. Mm. So lots and lots of people develop some kick-ass magic skills when they're in school during that adolescence. It's also when we get poltergeists and hauntings and all sorts of other phenomenon. And I think it's both the um, massive amounts of energy that are going through the body as those physical transformations are happening, they got to come from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. That, that hum is changing and causing the leaf to transform and, and go through, you know, and, and be different. And all of that energy is coming through, but also that's when human brains are at their biggest. After adolescence, mm -hmm. our brains actually start shrinking and we start losing neural connections. That's when we are the most powerful humans we can be. And it's often in our modern society when we have the least control over our lives. So it is no wonder that we develop magical skills because that's how we gain control. It's how we protect ourselves. It's how we survive. And uh, they don't always go great. Sometimes we get poltergeists, um, but sometimes they're amazing. And then usually, when we're older, we look back and we go, wow, I was a really great magician when I was in high school. What happened? You know, and it doesn't mean that we can't get back to that level or grow to that, that skill level in another way. It just means that the circumstances were nearly perfect at that time for that to develop in humans. And I think that's also why there are so many initiation rites and rites of passage in our early uh, indigenous and tribal societies that help guide and protect um, the person as they grow through that time where, mm. you know, the energy is bubbling over and, and stuff is happening. You know, now's the time to strike while the iron is hot, forge it on the anvil instead of just letting it burn out. Yeah. Um, Andrea, I I've lost it now. There it is. Hubby is a musician and I consider music magical. I uh, completely agree with you. In fact, mm -hmm. if you haven't already, have a look into the solfeggio frequencies. That's popped up on my radar again. Mm. Uh, very interesting. Music, um, is, music is very yeah. magical. It's the art of vibration and harmony, which magic. Mm, definitely. Uh, one, hello. One, how are you? Um, that sounds like doing to be instead of doing from being. Now you've just messed up my head. <laughs> I'm not sure what that was in reference to, but I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> um, they also asked uh, that Cole man, Cole man with his shadow work. Do you think it has a place in magical study? I'm assuming you're going to be, you're talking about young 
Um, we actually did a uh, blackout chat about well about four weeks ago now, um, specifically about shadow work. So if you want to check that out, just go into the playlist black hat chat playlist it'll be in there yeah we talked about um, some Jungian stuff in there yeah it definitely has a place um and we actually discussed a whole load of aspects regarding shadow work yeah um, it, it's called shadow work now it didn't always, it wasn't always called shadow work but it's always been a necessary part of magical practice i think yeah it's so. just when so i think somebody picked up on the whole young aspect and uh yeah it forward and make it made it a bit more pronounced um andrea when i was little i was really good mother tried to not uh yeah i know some parents shouldn't be parents um now it seems that uh, one has to unlearn stuff to make magic work stronger things you learn in years of adult adulthood under other people's influence and so on yeah um it's definitely a problem for a lot of people uh, especially if, if you know depending on the culture you're coming from or the religion you're coming from um we grow up being told don't do this don't do that uh this is not real that's not real and then when we start on a magical path we realize that those things were real and we didn't have to stop doing x y and z and we've got to deprogram ourselves yeah which can be a long process for a lot of people unlearning is unlearning the limitations and the uh stepping stones that aren't useful is a really important part of magic that goes right along with shadow work um we need to know ourselves truly and not just the masks we've picked up the ones we've been taught are okay and we have to unlearn limits you know mm. um that's one thing that was a big thing when i was younger especially when i was in school i always always reinforced whenever anyone said to me oh you won't be able to get this done there's not enough time and i would say time's not real my mind is limitless i mean just mm. because i had to constantly fight back against that reinforcing of other people's perspectives that my mind was limited my time was limited there was linear time and i could only do this much and this much and this much and i had to just fight that constantly i was able to because i had support from my parents and my godparents and my family but not everyone is able to do that and still to this day i have to fight back i mean most people have had a conversation with me have heard me go time's not real just <laughs> drop that in there as we talk along because that's my way of, of making sure that i maintain those boundaries that keep me from being limited by other people's perspectives and the bits of the worldview that i find not useful that i have to cross the hedge in order to to use so every time i do that every time i say time's not real my mind is limitless i'm jumping that hedge i am pushing that boundary uh from that macro mm. over culture yeah um one's earlier uh comment about so uh, that sounds like doing to be instead of doing from being has but was actually referring to the, the experience of um talking about meditation you know somebody starts meditation and it was fantastic the next day they do it and they they push too hard expecting the same results so yeah, that make that makes sense to me now. <laughs> yeah, thank you for explaining that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Between the delay and the many many things that we talk about and the many tangents we run down, sometimes we cannot track it all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you know, when it comes to magical experiences, when it comes to developing magical skills, don't repeat. Mm. You know, if you're going for a repetition, if you're going for repeating the same experience, then you are limiting yourself from having the experience. You can practice your skills, but that's not the same as repeating the experience. That's the whole thing of um, treat every day and every practice as if you've never done it before. Mm -hmm. 
Look at the yeah, world then... with wonder and awe. Yeah, because then, then you're not expecting anything. It's when you have that, those expectations um, because you've had it, it, something happened, so you expect it to happen again exactly the same way, and it's not going to. So we just go into the next day and then and the next practice as if we're babies and we've never done it before. Um, best way to do it. Not yeah. easy, though. Oh, Definitely it's not, not easy. easy. It, it's, it's always worked to cultivate that sense of childlike wonder. And mm. that sense of childlike wonder is so important because it is open to possibility. It is open to experience. It is open to different experiences. You know, um, one thing I talk about frequently is the importance of play. When we were kids, we played, right? Play was an activity. You did the play, mm. you know, you went to play. That did not um, talk about the content of the play. The activity mm. itself was exploration and pursuit of experience that caused growth. And often as adults, we don't do that. We pursue skills. We pursue uh, making money. We might even pursue making a thing like through crafting. But rarely do we pursue play, which is so important, so important for continued growth, especially when we get to the point where we're not really physically growing anymore, but we're interested in spiritual and magical and energetic growth. We must approach our practice with that sense of play, that we are out to have an experience. We are going to go with the experience and see what we learn from it. And yes, we um, will practice our skills in that respect, but what we get back from that, we must not layer and bog down with expectation, with result. We have to mm. let that be the open imaginative part of our play. Yeah. Um, Kerry said, unlearning. I started listening to my intuition, and instead of attention-seeking behaviors in getting the opinions of others, I discovered that I am enough and my best advisor. Yep, completely agree. Um, there's also the, the um, aspects of as we meet people, they have a, an immediate opinion of who we are and what we are and what we do and everything else. And that opinion actually uh, imprints on us. So what we're doing throughout life is taking everybody's opinions, mixing them all together, and that's who we become. Um, so one of the ways to, or one of the practices is to actually stop that and it's, it's basically like stopping the world and, uh, you know, finding out who we are, who we actually are and comes back to shadow work, especially what, what we spoke about with, um, oh, I forgot his name, Franz Baden, Franz Baden's mm -hmm. work where we don't just look at the the dark mirror, we look at the light mirror as well, because they are both aspects of the soul um, in order to find out who we are. And both can be beneficial and destructive at the same time, depending, depending on what it is. Yeah. Yeah, Carrie, mm -hmm. in, in trad witchcraft, at least, uh, in my experience, we call that sitting in sovereignty or claiming the crown, where mm -hmm. we, we learn to... Um, give ourselves sovereignty over our own expression but it's not isolation and it's real easy for that to slip into isolation instead of um, ignoring and rejecting the opinions and the attention of others we learn to sit within sovereignty and react to them in ways that we want and that we find helpful and useful and it's a ongoing process it's not a one and done you got to do it again and again which is why it's at a certain point on the wheel of the year you come around and mm -hmm. you do it again and again and um, isolation is part of that process but it is not the goal of that process and unfortunately a lot of people especially on solitary paths um, whose primary connection to witchcraft is through the internet get lost in the forest of isolation and never come back from exile to claim the crown and 
that's because the culture of general out there internet mixes with general out there paganism and results in that process instead of allowing allowing that space for sovereignty and recognition of that and that mutual joining hope that made mm. sense mm. it did it's just again it's finding the right community um if you've got the wrong community you know especially just a general western mindset um you saw a ghost and all of a sudden you know you're a silly bugger or you started hearing voices and they put you in the insane, insane asylum um but if you find the right community when you start hearing voices they understand what it is and they can actually help you through it uh, so again back to community and on yeah. that topic <laughs> if you haven't joined the Wildwood Temple yet, go to the link in the description and join. It's our community. <laughs> we aim to run a community that we talk about like this and make sure that we are we are supporting one another and we are all growing and we're all different. This is not, mm -hmm. you know, just uh, demon alolaters or kind of got that word or astrologers or trad witches or heathens, you know. Um, we all have different paths and we all have different ways we grow, but oh my word, do we need other people that are reasonable to talk about those things. And mm. so, you know, they did it in ancient times. They had the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. They had the Library of Alexandria in Alexandria, you know, and we want that now. And these days we have the internet and video chats and all sorts of cool things to be able to do it. Yeah. Um difficult years with the internet there's a lot of uh, funny people out there yeah i mean we're, we're funny we're strange we're weird and but, uh, hopefully we're the good ones fit is really important too fit is very important and your fit will change your energy that you are seeking and that you are putting out changes over the course of your life so you're going to need to be in different communities with different people at different times and you know they can overlap you can be in multiple communities at the same time so just because you find one that's super good and it just feels like the coat's too tight and it doesn't fit that doesn't mean it's wrong or it's bad it's just not right for you right now mm. um one asked uh would it be better to find a commune in a literal physical setting or do you see that internet communication works just as well it depends entirely on you, I think. Um, you know, some people, I mean, you can talk about a commune or, or an ashram or a coven, whatever it is, that's a physical place where people of like mind are getting together and practicing, talking, etc. Some people cannot do that. Um, I was actually reading something earlier about um, a woman uh, was commenting she's an empath. She cannot get together with a group of people because she walks out of there and she has to take two days to recover. Um, so it, it depends entirely on you. Some people just, I find it very difficult to join groups myself. Uh, probably because I'm just too opinionated half the time, but you know, I end up having an argument with somebody at some point. Um, yeah. But in, internet communication can definitely work but at the same time, a physical connection is also very useful. Yeah, there. it's not one is better than the other, and it's not one is better than the other at all times for all people. There are advantages and disadvantages in both of those settings, and there are ways to do it other than that also. Um, we're just trying to recognize that everybody's got needs and we're trying to meet them as best we can and recognize that those needs are going to shift and how those needs are met are going to shift some people thrive in a setting like a convent or uh you know a mosque great they're doing wonderful uh, some people that is not what they need and the um possibility for connection over the internet is great i mean Lee and I have connected multiple times over the years. We have a strong bond. We have very different paths. We've never met in person. We're on different continents, mm. you know, but 
we've managed to do magic together, we've managed to study together, we've managed all sorts of interesting things, but not 24-7 for the last 20 years either. Mm. There have been times when that has not been um, what we need or where we can develop and grow. So, yes, all things <laughs> in their time and in their vibration. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one also said, I find myself unable to proceed easily with shadow work or any esoteric work lately. I have a lot of anger at friends and family lately, and I feel cut off from myself. Um, yeah, it, it happens. We do go through different phases, um, just like the moon does, just like the year does. Um, so you'll probably find that you'll grow for a while, and then you'll plateau, and then you'll grow a bit more again. Um, but Sometimes yeah, getting, we go backwards. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes we go backwards. So we do have these periods where we just keep pushing and pushing and pushing to try and do magic, and it's actually a time when you should sit back and reflect. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're getting some flack from friends and family, I'm not sure why you're ang angry at friends and family. Oh, I understand that. Reasons for that. I'm fucking I do as well. pissed at lots of people. <laughs> yeah. For acting the fool. That's that's a daily basis. Yeah. And, you know, when that sort of thing comes up and you keep trying to do something and you keep running into these blocks, it's time to dismantle the block. And if what you're doing isn't working, try a different tack. Um, you know, the planets move forward and they move retrograde. Sometimes we have to go back into ourselves. Sometimes we need to find the root of things. Sometimes we need to have outward projecting energy, right? you know, um, being blocked, feeling unable to progress is part of the progress. It is, it's a crooked path. It's not a straight line, mm. you know, and, and it doubles back on itself sometimes and it comes around to the same things over and over again. Um, another, yeah. another of my favorite teacher sayings is you got to keep going you can bitch the whole time but you got to keep going <laughs> yeah but i mean that even even if you are sitting back and reflecting i think you are still going yeah that is still um, going yeah um one can i suggest that you uh, join us on the wildwood temple facebook group um we can always talk about uh, what you're going through more there because mm -hmm. uh, we've we've been on here for two and a half hours, uh, well, probably two hours. Getting close to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. One. One. If you can just go into the, if you're not on the Facebook on the Wildwood Temple group yet, yeah, just go into the description and the videos or streams and uh, just click through there and give it a shot. If you're not on Facebook. Um, I'll find, a, I'll find a way to join. Okay, if, I was going to say, if you're not on Facebook, you can always uh, go onto one of our sites and just contact us there. Mm -hmm. uh, links to it all. There's loads of links in the descriptions. Um, so. Yeah, so I think it's going to be an on, ongoing discussion that will be. Yeah, yeah. one of those things. Uh, yeah. Um, Andrea said earlier, uh, before we got off of our shape-shifting topic, that... Mm -hmm. um, when I was talking about playing as a child, she'd say, I'd be different animals in playing. And mm. yeah, absolutely. I think that very much ties into shape shifting and the development of shape shifting skills and how it's just so very natural for humans to do it. Mm. You know? And um, I'm sure most people can remember some childhood friend that always wanted to be the dog. That's like a super common experience or the cat or something like that, right? You know, mm. um, playing at house or, or other games like that. Or someone was always the one who chased or someone was always the one who, run it, who ran out front. I think all of those are um, the early development of shape-shifting skills and those aptitudes and inclinations that we have. But... It's very easy to do that development. It's very easy to make those skills at that time because we have that childlike wonder. 
that mm -hmm. openness to possibility to believe I can go play a dog. I can go play a cat. You know, I can have this experience. I can, and it, it involves a bunch of the shape-shifting techniques that we now use in modern times, like get down on our floors and try to move like the animal and make the noises. And especially in play, if you can have another person reinforcing that for you and responding to you as if you are that animal, that's very much like what, you know, some indigenous societies would do when the magic technician would put on the skin of the reindeer or the other prey animal and take on those movements and sounds in order to connect with the energy of the herd so that they could ask for a sacrifice, so on and so forth. It, and the community would reinforce the, uh, that person shape-shifting into the animal and becoming that. So again, community is so important. We can do these things by ourselves, but it helps to do them in community. And that's one I think you probably need some physical um, interaction with, some physical space. I'm sure that there are people that have found a way to do it online effectively because different things work for different people. I haven't, but uh, that doesn't mean it's not possible. Mm. It's, it's a bit like fake it till you make it as well. Oh. I was actually reading um, something by Jason Miller. Uh, he was talking about uh, when the first time he actually invoked uh, a spirit uh, into, well, into possession. And what he did was he, he literally faked it till he make, made it. So he was walking around the crowd and saying things as if he was the God. Um, and then eventually it actually came through. Um, so similar there. So well, you, you start acting like the animal in order to change, shift your energy into that, that paradigm. You need to get your vibrations lined up. It's not really yeah. faking it. It's aligning. You yeah. know, if, if you are going to shape shift into a wolf, you're going to have to get into the vibration of the wolf until you are on the same frequency, until you are in harmony. Because mm. nothing can cross that doorway if the door is not open. So I don't, I mean, fake it has a kind of idea behind it in our modern lexicon that it's not real again. Mm. But if it's part of the process, if it's part of the alignment process to get there, then it's very much real. It's just a different part of the process. It's the transition portion instead of mm. the connection portion. And to realize that there is a transition portion on the way there before the connection also helps us to realize there's a transition portion on the way back. And that's very yeah. important. Very, very important. You don't want to get stuck or you don't want to hang there because mm. it, things will not flow again. Stuff will get backed up. You have to be able to move through. You have to be able to go in and out. It is crossing the hedge, not living on the other side of the hedge. Mm. We've still got to continue in daily life all right shall we call it a day because we have definitely been on for more than two hours now <laughs> we got five more minutes, five more okay. minutes. <laughs> the space hawk said uh, ancient furies hi space hawk how are you ancient furries yeah mm. yeah well the furry community and, and that phenomenon, I think, is an outgrowth of humans being humans. Oh, sorry, is it furries? I read it as furies. Mm. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I still have tea. I made a big old pot this morning. Lots of my lots butt's, of tea. My butt's starting to get numb on this chair. <laughs> you gotta do the little butt squeezes so you can stay <laughs> longer. <laughs> Just do that. There we go. <laughs> uh, but Andrea said. I seem to be naturally aligned to animals rather than humans. And I think that's a very common experience. Lots of people have mm. that experience. And it may be uh, one or two specific animals. It may be animals in general. Um, but, you know, that's, I think that's just a human thing. And it, it's, it's a thing we find frequently in the witch community, because if you're just aligned with humans and you don't feel that call, why are you going to go change? you know, and move over to the other side and try to find other people. 
So. Um, Space Rock said, and, and like LARPing, cosplaying, and furries is kind of chaos magic. I think it's not just chaos magic, it's uh, all magic. Yeah. Um, it, it's. You know, and we, we've come back to the mirror neurons here, especially, you know, something like um, role playing and LARPing and stuff like that, is that you are imagining yourself as something, being someone, and the mirror neurons will experience that. It, it's not just imagination. It, it The brain actually experiences it as, as being that. Yeah. And it shifts the energy and you become it. Kerry said, I must do kegels. So. <laughs> Flute squeezes. But yes, <laughs> cosplaying, furries, LARPing, all of that is... I would say it is chaos magic um, mm. because chaos magic is a big umbrella that it uses a lot of modern technology and adapts it in order to perform magic, you know? Um, so, and that really works great for some people and doesn't connect at all for other people. Um, a lot of my friends and family are totally into RPGs. It's their thing. They love doing it. They love D and D and doing LARPing and that sort of thing. It doesn't connect for crap for me. It doesn't work. I understand how it works intellectually. I can see the enjoyment and the transformation and the growth that they get out of it. And I'm super happy for them, but it's just not my thing, you know? Mm. And so you're going to come across stuff like that. You're going to come across techniques. You're going to come across ideas that either click and turn you on and make those connections for you or you'll really try because you see other people doing it and it just didn't work and that's okay because it's not all things for everyone it's different things mm. for different people at different times i mean the whole um furries and uh cosplay and stuff is just sort of a modern interpretation of the rituals where we where we would mask Mm -hmm. And as you said, actually put the skin on in order yep. to trans transform into the particular animals. Yep. Andrea asked, what is LARPing? LARPing is an acronym, Live Action Role Play, L-A-R-P. So, usually... Similar to cosplay, yeah. Yeah, cosplay. LARPing often involves actually playing out... Um, battles or scenarios um adventures that sort of thing like tabletop role playing except it's dressing up and going out and doing it in the field mm. so uh, yeah all right are we going to call that day now <laughs> i i suppose i will let you go i suppose oh, um, i'll get the blood circulating in my butt again <laughs> so before we go a few uh references there is a good chapter on um, shape-shifting in Call of the Horn Piper, if you want kind of a traditional witchcraft aspect. And there's some masking and guising stuff in there. Uh, of um, Also, and of course, um, his, uh, Nigel Jackson's book, um, Mass of Misrule, also has masking and guising stuff. Um, but the, the book that's probably referenced the most uh, in this field is Human Animals by Frank Hamill. And um, he's got, I think, I haven't read it yet, but I think it's the updated revised version that's called Werewolves, Bird Women, Tiger Men, and Other Human Animals by Frank Hamill. So if you want to look up some stuff and, and read some things, those are some, some go-to books. Um, there's also Monsters by John Michael Greer, while it's not specifically about shape-shifting. Uh, John Michael Greer always has amazing work. He does excellent research and is a very good writer, in my opinion. Um, there's some interesting stuff in there, too. So There's also um, Evan John Jones, uh, Sacred mm. Masks, Sacred Dance, which is quite good. Yes, yes. Um, it's, it's a nice book because it actually shows you how to make masks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, did I miss anything? No, there we go. Right then, thank you for joining us this week. Uh, we do apologize for the interruptions, but uh, we've, we've, we finally got to shapeshifting. <laughs> and 
Uh, here we go. Andrea, I met my fetch during astral travel. There I was in a sweat lodge and changed. Yes, I don't remember you telling us it was, it was uh, changed into a horse as far as I remember. That's why you like horses so much. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, as, as, of, as we keep saying, if you haven't joined the Wildwood Temple, please do so. We'd love to hear from you there. Uh, we can have lengthy discussions and chats in, in the, on the group. And uh, if you'd like to support us, you can go to either Patreon or buy me a coffee. Links are in the description. And we'll see you next week. We are talking about, what was it again? Necromancy. Necro necromancy, yes. Or necromancy, as I falsely say it. I keep, Kyra keeps knocking me on the head saying, stop saying that, it's not right. It just comes out naturally. <laughs> <laughs> you can say necromancy and I can say demonana laetry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we can all go bleh, bleh. very scientifically, yes. The scientific term, bleh. Yeah. <laughs> Which is different than <laughs> bleh. Right, so. <laughs> get, yeah. all, get all our... And, Andrew, Andrew is supporting my buttock circulation. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. We will see you next week. Have a good one.